So Noah's flood, was it a global flood or a local flood? For most of church history, nearly all Christian and Jewish Bible scholars believe that the flood described in Genesis chapter 6 to 9 covered the whole earth. On plain reading, scripture teaches that there was a year-long global flood, about 1,650 years after creation. Confusingly and sadly today, many church pastors and teachers imposing ideas on the text attempt to try and make the scriptures fit with the eons of time required in the prevailing view held by the majority of modern scientists who believe in the general theory of evolution. For instance, presently dating the earth as between 4.5 and 4.6 billion years old. Such teachers argue that the flood of Noah's day was local, normally said to cover the area of Mesopotamia. That's the part of Western Asia situated within the river systems of the Tigris and Euphrates. A worldwide flood would mean that the vast majority of fossils were due to the cataclysm of this flood and not due to suppose millions of years of animal and human deaths before Adam. But today many church leaders are no longer willing to accept this. Let me give five sets of reasons why I think the Genesis flood was worldwide. First, anyone reading without preconceptions the language in Genesis 6 to 9, chapters 6 to 9, would conclude the flood was worldwide. Genesis 6.13 reads, And God said to Noah, I've determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Likewise, Genesis 7.19 to 23 states, And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swimming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heaven. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. Now, how could the Lord have made this any clearer? Nevertheless, local flood advocates counter that the word all can be used in a non-universal sense. Used in isolation, this can occasionally be the case, but not in a context where so many words stress the all-encompassing nature of the flood, with phrases such as, under the whole heaven. This particular phrase, under the whole heaven, is used six times elsewhere in the Old Testament and makes its universality clear. E.g. Job 41.11 reads, Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. And that's God speaking of his ownership. And God's ownership is certainly not local or regional. Some object that Mount Everest is 8,849 metres high. And it was impossible for the flood water to cover this mountain. However, scientists who believe in Noah's flood being global point out that this mountain, like many others, were raised rapidly to their present heights by geological upheavals, including catastrophic plate tectonic activity that took place after the original and lower mountains were covered by the global flood. Significantly, Everest has marine limestone at its peak, containing fossils of sea bottom dwelling crinoids. The Genesis account never says that the mountains were all covered at their present height. There was plenty of water from the breaking up of what Genesis 7.11 calls the fountains of the great deep, and also from the opening of the windows of heaven. It's been calculated that if the earth was flattened to a smooth sphere, the depth of the water 
would be 2,686 metres deep. That's one and two third miles. Secondly, the flood is described in the Bible as a direct parallel to the worldwide extent of the coming judgment. Of mockers doubting the return of Jesus and the coming judgment, Peter wrote the following in 2 Peter 3 verses 5 to 7. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The coming judgment will be global, just as the flood was. Jesus stressed everyone not on the ark died, just as fearful judgment awaits all those who reject the salvation in Jesus. So Matthew 24, 37 to 39 reads, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the days of the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Again, this is a global judgment paralleling the global flood. Third, in Genesis 9, 11 to 16, God makes an everlasting, unconditional covenant with Noah and all mankind and every living creature, with a rainbow being a sign of this covenant that he would never again destroy all flesh by a flood. God says, there will never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Of course, if the flood was local, then God will have would have repeatedly broken this covenant, this promise, as there have been many local and regional floods since then. For instance, 80% of Bangladesh has been covered by flooding. This also shows that the Hebrew word Eretz, as used in the flood narrative, refers to the whole earth here, not just a local region. Fourth, if the flood was just local, why did God instruct Noah to build a massive ark? He could have told Noah to leave that land. After all, Abraham, at God's command, left Ur in Mesopotamia and emigrated from Mesopotamia, ending up in Canaan, a land his descendants would inherit according to the Lord's promise. Noah and his family were on the ark, according to most scholars, for 370 days. You can work that out from Genesis 7, 11 and 8, 14. Why bother putting land animals and birds on the ark if the flood was local? As they can migrate great distances. For instance, many of our swallows arrive annually in springtime here in England from southern Africa. The ark was the size of an ocean liner because it needed to be large enough to hold all pairs of the kinds of land vertebrate animals that were alive at the time. And fifth, not only does the Bible teach that everyone is descended from Adam, as per the genealogies of Genesis 4 and 5, but in Genesis 10 it makes it clear that all post-flood people were descended from Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, who along with their wives were the only humans on the ark. In conclusion, Professor James Barr, formerly Oriel Professor of Interpretation of the Holy Scripture at Oxford University, who was actually liberal in his views on Genesis, didn't personally believe the account was the word of God, Nevertheless, in a letter to creationist David C.C. C. Watson, 23rd of April 1984, on the meanings in Genesis, wrote that, probably as far as he was aware, there was no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who did not believe that the writers of Genesis 1-11 to intended to convey to their readers, quote, that Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide, and extinguished all human life and animal life, except for those in the ark. Thank you for listening.